în toamna lui 40, când, așa cum a spus și colegul, exista poliția regională, aveam cursul după masă. Plecam de la școală seara. Am avut un coleg, mai din ea zicea, băiați, bă, aveam 17 ani, în piață, în alt slab, l-au luat în jurnalie într-o seară, când ieșeam de la școală, și l-au bătut și l-au omorât. Adică se spune că l-au omorât în bătaie. L-au omorât efectiv. A fost și jaf. Pe lângă, pe lângă bătaia pe care au primit-o evrei acolo, a fost jaful de pe lume. Cel puțin pe strada mm -hmm. Și în momentul în care treceau așa prin case și nu știu ce, nu exista să... să, să trebuia să demonstreze că că îi cumințește pe evrei în sensul, sau pe gitan, cum vrei să-i spune, în sensul că se le dea o lecție. Și asta a fost. În casele care au intrat, au fost date lecții. Iar ideea făcută de părinții noștri, mei, că să strângă tot, că o să dea foc la cadă și o să poată să plece cu... Asta a fost o idee copilărească. E sigur și-au dat seama ulterior când a văzut ce a, ce -a făcut la barat acolo. Good evening. Here we are after the streaming of the movie My Illusions uh, on the Facebook page of the Romanian Cultural Institute in Tel Aviv. My name is Martin Solomon. We are together with the director of the movie, Olga Stefan. Hello, Olga. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, today uh, we had a, an interesting event we have an interesting event marking the International uh, Day of Re Holocaust Remembrance Day uh, with this movie, uh, which uh, was directed by you and which is um, uh, portraying uh, four of the uh, four of the witnesses of the Bucharest pogrom that took place 80 years ago, uh, uh, between 21st and 23rd. Uh, January 1941. Uh, this this movie is a part of uh, of your bigger project, uh, Future of Memory. Can you describe us uh, your your project and uh, also, if possible, your personal motivation uh, of uh, for dealing with um, with the um, uh, subject of uh, Holocaust remembrance. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, so the Future of Memory is a, a project that uh, I initiated at the end of 2016 after an exhibition that I uh, curated uh, in Yash called Fragments of a Life. And Fragments of a Life um, is, uh, is an exhibition that has as its point of departure the pogrom, the Yash pogrom which took place in, uh, in, in late June, 1941. And during which time 13,000 Jews were killed on the streets of Yash. And um, this exhibition was actually the result of my um, preoccupation with family history and uh, family memory. And um, it actually came from my move, let's say this preoccupation, uh, started um, with my move to Switzerland from Chicago. I was raised in Chicago. I emigrated from uh, Bucharest as a child with my family to Chicago, and then later in life as an adult uh, from Chicago to Switzerland. And um, my background is in contemporary art curation meaning organizing exhibitions of contemporary art. And um, once I arrived in Switzerland, I uh, became very preoccupied with the condition of the foreigner uh, because that was my condition at the time. <laughs> I became the foreigner once again, having mm -hmm. immigrated um, 
having emigrated from Chicago, where finally I had become American, uh, having emigrated once again, and uh, once again, being pushed to this uh, status of foreigner. So this preoccupation with the, with the uh, condition of the foreigner gave way to family history, uh, kind of digging into family history. And how is it that family history affects and shapes your personal identity? These were kind of the themes that I was dealing with. And of course, migration and belonging and all of these kind of concepts. So um, these preoccupations led me to um, doing research into family history and uh, ultimately um, um, discussing with my grandmother uh, her personal uh, biography. And this discussion uh, is materialized in a video called Fragments of a Life. And um, then later, the video became the central piece in the exhibition Fragments of a Life, where I exhibited works that dealt with memory of the pogrom um, and films that were made about the Yash pogrom and uh, books and autobiographies that had not been necessarily translated into Romanian that dealt with the memory of the pogrom in the subsequent generations. So from that exhibition, I expanded my uh, reach, let's say, into family history and uh, became aware of the different, um, different um, persecutions that my family and different branches of my family experienced during the Holocaust. Um, I have Hungarian members of the family that were, of, of course, submitted to the Hungarian um, persecution that started in 1944 with the deportations from Northern Transylvania directly to Auschwitz um, in May 1944. So that was one side of the, of the family, one branch of the family that experienced uh, uh, these, these deportations, while others like uh, those that originated in Yash or Bucharest experienced a different type of persecution as well. So the future of memory basically is a platform for Holocaust remembrance, uh, mostly through art and media um, that uh, deals with the different regions of what is currently Romania and Moldova. So, you know, when we say currently Romania, we also mean Northern Transylvania, which during the war was part of Hungary. So that, basically in a nutshell the, the future of memory with exhibitions and documentaries and recordings of survivors and uh, their children. So uh, as we understand you have Jewish roots and uh, you have an um, artistic background but it doesn't mean that you have um, you are a historian or a sociologist or a, a movie maker you do it uh, um, as, as a hobby. Um, well, right. as a hobby, um, this has become like my main preoccupation right now and my, my main activity. So it's true that I'm self-taught um, in terms of, uh, you know, document, documentary filmmaking and, um, and I'm also uh, a researcher now through my own, uh, let's say, um, my own efforts. I'm not trained as a historian. But through all of the work that I've been doing in the last few years, uh, research, of course, has become a very important component. And uh, the research that I do conduct is also in the archives, for example. I've accessed the National Archives. I've entered the Chenesas uh, archives. Um, so uh, this sort of historical uh, fact-based research which is obviously in contrast to subjective oral histories, um, is very much uh, an inherent part of the project itself. Yeah, well, uh, oral history is a main instrument for this kind of uh, uh, witnesses to be, to be uh, kept and uh, preserved. And uh, you do it uh, in a very professional way. Uh, I... I I am uh, uh, overwhelmed with uh, all the 
all the movies I saw, uh, Gestures of Resistance, we presented it in October last year in the Romanian Culture Institute. It was already an, an online project, but before, Fragments from a Life, uh, the history of your grandmother, we, we could see it uh, in, 19, in 12, 12, 2019. In, in our premises, so Olga is a um, frequent uh, guest of the Romanian Cultural Institute in Tel Aviv, and we are very aware of your work and all our um, our audience is uh, is uh, very happy to have you. Now we have some, some already have some comments. Dan Romash Kanu, uh, film blogger, who. Uh, helped us with uh, many projects um, before. Uh, is can writing. I say hello to him. <laughs> a special hello yes. to Dan. <laughs> he he can hear you. Oh, okay. He he wrote he wrote a comment. Excellent interviews. Very valuable contributions for preserving the memory. Bravo, Olga. And Mihaela Grigor. Grigor, well done, Olga. I suppose you know her as well. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so you have many fans, fans, <laughs> fans in Israel, uh, and uh, I include myself uh, between them. Um, let's skip directly to the movie itself, uh, My Illusions. Um, the title it comes from one of your uh, subjects. Or, uh, uh -huh. Yes, you know, this is, um, My Illusions is a title that I gave um, at the end, of course, of filming and after a lot of consideration, because Serian uh, Pompilio, um, he speaks about the song, Illusi uh, Lamele, uh, which mm -hmm. was a very popular song uh, during, um, mm -hmm. during the interbellic period. And um, I couldn't find it anywhere. I really wanted to find it as, mm -hmm. a, as a file. And I searched so many different uh, databases and uh, archives, and I just couldn't find that, that um, song. Uh, but that song, to some extent, really incorporates um, the condition of uh, all of my uh, protagonists, because may maybe some of them indeed as Domnul Kotnareanu, Mr. Kotnareanu, um, you know, had communist sympathies or uh, maybe uh, as he explains in the film, you know, and yeah. why, and why this generation. This is um, a common, a common uh, uh, characteristics for the survivors. Many of them had the communist uh, sympathies uh, in the beginning of the communist. In the beginning, exactly. And, and I think that uh, uh, Mr. Kotnareanu, uh, explains it so succinctly and so accurately. Why is it that Jews of that generation might have had uh, communist sympathies? It's very clear why. Because in that uh, uh, sympathy for the left, maybe communist uh, mm -hmm. wing, uh, within that, you had a chance of survival. You had a chance of hope. Um, so I think that that's extremely important to underline and to reiterate every chance we have. Why is it that some Jews or many Jews had these, uh, you know, left uh, left wing sympathies? And uh, my illusions, of course, points to uh, the turn of uh, history and what happened ultimately later. Because even though they might have been enthusiastic about the liberation and the Soviet occupation in the beginning, uh, many people, of course, were because it was literally considered a liberation from under the fascist uh, oppression and, uh, and persecution. Um, nevertheless, with time, people started to understand what that meant to be later. You know, and uh, and I think that that song, although it was of course very popular in the interbellic period, encapsulates that uh, that situation for many Jews after the war. Your uh, subjects, uh, your protagonists, uh, I suppose it wasn't very difficult to find find them because they are all uh, uh, residents of the retirement home 
of the Jewish com community in Bucharest, the Moses Rosen retirement home. But I'm not sure it was very easy to convince them to speak about their uh, uh, memories uh, connected to those times. First of all, because it was a long time ago and uh, of course, because it was uh, painful to, to uh, go back to that times and to walk on the streets of Bucharest, of nowadays Bucharest, uh, to 2017, right? It was filmed, the yeah. movie. And um, to go to those places where they used to live and to remember. Uh, how did you convince them to to be uh, op to well, open I... their 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 soul and 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 heart because they uh, are very I... open open I'm, I, I, you can feel really that open. they are uh, they are um, ready to uh, get it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, um, despite the fact that many witnesses are very traumatized and do not necessarily want to speak about the past. And that was actually the case of my grandmother. It was very difficult. Yeah, very yeah, difficult. this is usual. Yeah, to get her to speak. So making that um, video with her was indeed um, a huge effort. Um, uh, for the whole family, because all of us had to kind of nudge her and push her and, and convince her. However, the people at the uh, Kameen, at the Moses Rosen Retirement Home, um, they are part of a group called Vrsta Batru, Fourth Age. And um, it, I think the administration initiated a lot of uh, cultural activities for the, uh, for the, the people who live there, for the um, residents at the retirement home. So through these cultural activities, um, they are kind of um, prepared and they are encouraged to speak about their past in order to create uh, artwork and maybe plays and different types of uh, cultural products based on their storytelling. So storytelling is a really important part of their cultural activities. And, um, and I think a lot of them are very willing to speak. And, uh, and this kind of um, um, involvement in various activities keeps them going. And I know for sure that Sterian Pompili, for example, is as active and engaged as he is because he feels that he's part of a community and that he can share different stories about himself with a public that actually um, is willing to receive that information and to listen to him. Um, he has told me several times that this is the real reason that he, um, he has lived such a long life because he feels enriched by the ability to exchange uh, from his own biography and, other, and hear other people's lives as well. So this is a very special case at this particular Kameen because I think that the, that the retirees that live there, the residents, to some extent feel like sharing their biographies is an enriching activity. Mm -hmm. I found very interesting to see how, how you, you brought them back to the crime scenes, let's say so, uh, and, and uh, taking us, taking the... Uh, the viewers of the movie to through the Jewish quarter in in the areas where where the scenes of the anti-semitic violence took place in uh, 80 years ago at the houses of the subjects uh, in the front of the buildings that played important roles in the life of the Jewish community and um, uh, even seeing uh, buildings that we know, but we didn't know uh, too much about those buildings. We, people who know more or less uh, the Jewish, the former Jewish quarter of Bucharest. And uh, this way we also, we can also find out about the conditions in which Jewish Jews of Bucharest lived during the war. Uh, details like, like the, the ratio 
of uh, the portion of food for Jews were half than the, those for others, like, like Jews need less food than others. These were very interesting uh, details about the everyday life and about the discrimination of the Jewish people. Uh, and um, um, I, I think you did a very good job with this, this um, presenting Bucharest as well, not just the story of uh, the history of the, the pogrom. We have some questions uh, thank you. from from <laughs> thank you. We have some. <laughs> you're welcome. Actually, <laughs> thank you for thank you for the the um, this feeling that you gave us. Miki Koren asks, um, when have been taken the interviews with the pogrom survivors? Okay, I can also answer. In 2017, right? Um, yes, uh, in 2017, some of them, and some of them in 2016, okay. when I came to Romania to um, do the exhibition Fragments of a Life in Yash. Mm -hmm. So I used that opportunity to also uh, do the interviews uh, at the Kamin with uh, some of the survivors, some of the witnesses. Mm -hmm. Don Romashkanu. Are you continuing these efforts, which I call last chance interviews? I especially have in mind people living in the US or Europe. Uh, yeah, I would love to be able to continue. In fact, I had a, a, a trip planned to Israel before COVID to come and to interview several people. Um, but now it's completely up in the air and I don't know what what can be done and when, uh, but yes, Don, it is a last minute effort. It yeah. is the last, the last effort. Yeah. The last he has effort. a point because yeah. time is clicking, yeah, mm -hmm. the clock. Yeah, it is the last chance. And um, I'm trying to, even in Europe, I'm trying to uh, find uh, survivors that I can interview. Recently, I uh, interviewed um, an artist from Romania who I discovered, discovered in the sense that I personally came to her uh, recently. I didn't know about her before. Um, and I interviewed her several hours of audio interviews. Uh, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I can't reach her because of the lockdown. She's in a retirement home herself. Um, and those are closed off entirely. So these challenges are really affecting uh, people's um, People's morale. I mean, really, uh, there's a lot of depression in these retirement homes and loneliness, and it's really uh, devastating, in fact. So the conclusion is that I would love to, of course, um, when I can. Uh, do you, can you, can you tell us about the impact uh, of, of your activity? Because uh, I think the main, main um, uh, goal must be to, to make a change. In, in the um, general population, in the non-Jewish uh, audience, to make them understand that, uh, uh, as, as Orwell said, and you, you use it in, in a motto, right, in your, uh, for your organization, what is that uh, motto, if you... Yes, that if you control the past, you control, you control the, the past. You control the future. No, if you know the, you control the, who controls the past controls the future, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, do you have uh, feedback? Do you have uh, um, people who tell you, okay, I didn't know before what happened, but. Uh, through these interviews, I understood that the uh, Holocaust was real and uh, we, we must keep the memory. Um, well, um, it's very hard to gauge actually the exact impact and if indeed these activities have created a transformation, a real transformation in people. Um, one of the components of the, the activities that um, 
that we've conducted with the Future of Memory has been art workshops uh, about uh, the, the, the history, the local history of different cities during the Holocaust. So uh, we, uh, we created um, educational art, art workshops in Siget, for example, Siget Marmatie, in Siget, in uh, Mediash, uh, and um, actually in Bucharest as well, um, that uh, with high school students, you know? And uh, of course, this is the generation, the real generation that we need to target, you know? Um, and that, is, that we're hopeful. For you know that they're the next generation that will uh, hopefully change our society for the better. This is what we hope, and uh, all of us are putting our effort into this new generation. Um, and uh, I do have to say that I was um, very welcomed among them, um, and they were very open. And one of the workshops that I assigned, the workshop that I did with them was for them to go to the, the villages that they live in and to research the Jewish history in those villages and to create a historical um, narratives, let's say, about that history that they researched in their villages. Um, maybe do a little PowerPoint pre presentation or maybe do a little video uh, about that history, et cetera. Interestingly enough, they were all very enthusiastic to do this work and they presented uh, the history uh, very lovingly, let's say, uh, and they did do the, the necessary research. But when they were asked, why do you think um, there was um, anti-Semitism? What led to this hatred, for example? Um, they had reasons that they got from their grandparents. And they repeated those reasons that they received from their grandparents without any real analysis or questioning. It was very um, kind of interesting. And that brings us to um, understand a little bit how the transmission of hatred uh, and, and the power of this transmission, you know, um, functions basically. Because uh, even our generation or the generation of our kids are so influenced by um, past perceptions that they just repeat them, those past perceptions. So indeed it is our duty to work for the long haul, not just in one workshop, not just in one kind of week event, to work really at dismantling these perceptions, these false perceptions, and to really create uh, um, uh, um, an atmosphere and kind of a, uh, an educational uh, policy that um, encourages learning about the other, you know? Um, and unfortunately, I don't think in Romania there is this policy. I know in fact that there isn't this policy about really learning the history, the culture of the other and who is that other in Christian societies, it has always been uh, the Jew, but in Romania, there's also other uh, uh, minorities that have a place and that should be uh, included, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of um, outreach. Mm -hmm. So you think uh, the measures that were taken in Romania in order to acknowledge the history of Holocaust, right? Like, like, uh, uh, optional uh, classes, history classes, are are not enough, or are only on the surface, and are not uh, having the necessary impact uh, well, I, without I, without the civil society's uh, contribution. Right. Well. Uh, you know, because I worked in these high schools for this limited amount of time, I was very, very closely confronted to what they actually are taught. So um, in terms of history. So what they're taught is um, uh, about Germany's impact on the Holocaust, you know, and Germany indeed is the only culpable actor in the, uh, in, in the Holocaust during these lessons. There is mention of Auschwitz, you know, there's mention of the killing uh, that was conducted at Buchenwald and, uh, and uh, other camps. 
um, by the Nazis. But in terms of Romania's, uh, you know, actual uh, participation, that's almost zero. And when it is mentioned, it is mentioned in the context of the um, uh, Soviet uh, oppression of Romania and how the Soviet Union, of course, occupied Basarabia and uh, that Romania was basically just taking back its previous uh, land holdings. Um, and that without the Soviet Union, Romania wouldn't have done anything. So this is what's being taught in high schools, that it's justified, uh, Romania's actions were justified to some extent because of the Soviet aggression. Um, and I even had a dispute with one of the history teachers who in my presentation to his students kept intervening to correct me uh, about what I was uh, describing uh, about the Transnistrian killing fields. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he kept intervening to inform his students that in fact it was Soviet aggression that caused the, <laughs> the Transnistrian killing field and that it didn't really happen to quite that extent. Um, so this is what we're confronted by and there's absolutely no uh, uh, policy that uh, mandates for teachers to teach Romania's contribution to uh, the massacre of uh, uh, 500,000, 400,000 Jews, you know. So there's no mandate uh, on that level to teach that. I remember on, on, the, uh, on the other movie, um, uh, Gestures of Resistance that we presented in October, that uh, some of the subject had very strong messages for uh, today's generations, for, for the politicians, not just uh, uh, the general public, uh, regarding the recrudescence of the uh, anti-Semitism in uh, modern times. Um, so mainly, your organization, your platform is uh, part of this fight against the recrudescence of anti-Semitism. Anti can, can you say, can we say that it's a militant uh, uh, idea here? Yeah. Not just, not just movie making. Uh, well, I hope that through my movies, you know, I don't know if I could call them movies, but, you know, recordings, let's say, of personal stories. Um, I hope that through this effort, um, I, I, I... Don't say, don't say are not movies. These are documentary movies and uh, in a, a really high level. It's not just, re, re, um, how to say, some... some uh, uh, witnesses uh, it's edited and it's put yeah. together as it should be I think uh, it's a documentary movie yeah yeah it is a documentary I just don't yeah. know if I can claim to be you know anyway mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. my, my, my personal issue mm -hmm. but um, you know I do Let's hope see. this is my, my uh, intention mm -hmm. that uh, through these uh, documentaries that through these um, it is, becomes very clear that we need to eradicate uh, anti-Semitism, but not only any sort of uh, racism, any sort of uh, oppression of ethnic uh, groups, and um, and we're we're in the middle of uh, of that need to reiterate that again. You know, for the past few years, it's become clearer and clearer that racism is on the rise. Um, that, uh, you know, uh, um, anti-Semitism is on the rise and that we're in very, very um, shaky terrain, you know, uh, right now. So it mandates a huge effort uh, 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 of, of many different uh, parts of civil society, different parties to stem out this, uh, this, this, um, this uh, situation and to, to fight against it somehow. But that mean, this, this means solidarity across different fields, 
you know? And sometimes, unfortunately, these different parties are in conflict with each other uh, and the, the narration is in conflict, you know? So this is indeed a challenge. How do you uh, connect to different parts of civil society uh, to, to counter the rise in nationalism, to counter the rise in uh, xenophobia, uh, and of course, anti-Semitism, which is an inherent part of the rise of those uh, tendencies, you know? Um, and, and how do you um, connect with a different group whose maybe narrative conflicts with your own. That's the challenge that we need to, to deal with. And I think that solidarity is the tool that will help us to overcome the differences uh, that, that all of us as minorities face, you know. Well, uh, I think um, the most important thing is now to to reach out to other witnesses of those times, uh, not to lose the opportunities, these um, last minute, last chance interviews as one of our uh, viewers uh, uh, for, um, expressed himself. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, soon enough the um, the international situation, the COVID situation, will, the pandemic situation will allow you to, to do uh, new projects. We have one question here from Christian Pushkas. What practical measures do you think should be applied in order to spread and bring out the Jewish culture and history to the non-Jewish people in Romania? Um, to bring out the Jewish history and culture where, well, there are quite a lot of um, organizations, of course, um, who are involved, the Jewish, uh, Jewish State Theater, uh, for example, is one uh, cultural organization that promotes um, many uh, Jewish um, playwrights and um, Jewish plays. Um, of course, now there's a revival, in fact, uh, in uh, acknowledging the merits and the contributions of Jewish avant-gardists, Jewish writers, Jewish artists, uh, and their contribution to uh, Romanian culture. Um, there's always the question, you know, for example, there's a department at some university, maybe in Cluj, I'm not sure, so don't hold me responsible for making a mistake, but there is a department uh, that is called, or maybe a course that is called um, uh, Jewish and Romanian writers, you know, Jewish and Romanian writers. So, you know, the question is, uh, can we uh, look at writers who are Romanians, who have always been Romanian, but of uh, Jewish ethnicity, must we always, uh, you know, separate them as a different nationality? So then that goes to, of course, the Jewish uh, identity, because indeed, uh, Romanians have always seen Jews as different from Romanians and have always called them Jews. And Romanians have always been those Christian Romanians. So, you know, that also needs to be discussed to some extent. You know, uh, a lot of these writers and artists were Romanian but of Jewish nationality or Jewish ethnicity. So I don't know, there's lots of different things to discuss within that question, because of course, the identity of Jews is very complex. So some activities are purely cul Jewish cultural activities, you know, um, like the more traditional, maybe religious activities are indeed very typical uh, Jewish, but you know, writers and uh, artists, modernist uh, artists, you know, I don't know how Jewish they really were. They were, of course, in their artwork, I mean, you know, of course, some of them uh, wrote and represented Jewish topics in their artwork, but maybe some of them, a lot of modernists and avant-gardists, 
happened to also be Jewish, but were modernist uh, writers and cultural producers in their nature. So there's a lot of discussion and a lot of different ways of approaching that topic, you know. Okay, thank you. It was a very interesting uh, discussion in my opinion and uh, we enjoyed your movie. We, ho we hope that uh, soon enough you will come out with uh, new testimonies, uh, new thank documentaries you. with uh, testimonies uh, with survivors from Romania, from Europe, from worldwide. You can also do it in Israel, of course. And um, and uh, let's uh, let's split with a positive uh, message today. We have a Jewish holiday of uh, Tu Bishvat, which is um, the New Year of the trees. Uh, incidentally or accidentally, but I think it's a happy coincidence. It's a uh, in the same day, uh, it started yesterday evening, right? In the Erev Hag, uh, in the same day when the International Holocaust Remembrance Day was. So a uh, very sad commemoration with a happy, uh, a happy holiday, a Jewish holiday, which is mostly celebrated by children in schools because it's the, it's the celebration of the rebirth of the nature. Mm -hmm. So uh, Holocaust means dead, death, but to be Shvat started immediately after the Holocaust day, uh, the rebirth of uh, the Jewish uh, uh, nation and uh, nature here in Israel. Uh, even though uh, now it's raining and it's cold outside, but uh, soon enough the spring will come. And uh, I hopefully there in uh, Zurich, where you live, right? Yeah. Uh, the spring will come soon enough. Thank you very much, Olga. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys, keep for up, hosting. And... Keep up the good work and waiting for your new project to be presented here at the Icere Tel Aviv, the Romanian Cultural Institute in Tel Aviv, is eager to present your next projects. Uh, goodbye, everybody. Thank you are welcome to uh, follow us on the Facebook page of the Romanian Cultural Institute in Tel Aviv. Goodbye, good evening to everybody. Good evening, goodbye, thank you.